Welcome to Just Between Us, a podcast powered by the Corey Johnson Program for Post-Traumatic Healing in Boston. Every week, we focus on ways to heal from the devastating impact of collective trauma on our world. My associate on this show, Judell Cummins, is gone. She's seeking a different direction in her life, and we wish her well. But just between you and me, I've had a hard time adjusting to Judell's leaving. And it's made me think about how difficult change really is. We are living in a time of great change, and that's what I want to talk about today. Here's the blessing, though. Issa Bibbins, local musician and content creator and a musician for Roxbury Presbyterian Church, and Wyatt Jackson, Emmy Award-winning performing artist and artist-in-residence at the Corey Johnson Program, are joining me now on this podcast to help me through this rough time. Thanks for being here, guys. Hey, good to be here. It's so good to be here. What an honor. (laughs) And so let's get right into it. Let's talk about change. COVID-19 has certainly changed everything in life over the last 18 months, how we travel, how we relate to each other, how we work, how we live. And I'm not sure people really realize how much everything has changed. So my first question to you guys, Issa, what's the greatest change you've seen around you in the community, in the world? What, what's the greatest change that's impacted you since uh, COVID-19? I would have to say, uh, you know, really being comfortable uh, in close quarters. Um, COVID-19, being home, being with my family, not being able to, you know, do as much gigs and performances as a musician has really changed the way that, like, I engage people. And so for me, it's it's been really tough adjusting to not being able to be out in the social aspect of how I do music. Mm, mm. How about you, Wyatt? The same thing? Because you're both artists. Yes. And I would add to that, that um, a heightened sense of just uncomfortability, if, there's, if that's such a word, just feeling uncomfortable everywhere. Mm. Um, I have never felt this uncomfortable, ever. Really? Mm-hmm. Ever. Really? And I and I'm usually very comfortable around people, around places. Uh, you know, wherever I go, Brookline, Cambridge. I was in Brookline the other day, and I felt in Coolidge Corner, which is my favorite place in the whole world to hang out and relax. And I felt uncomfortable. Hmm. People were just not. I mean, it's just a very different world right now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, for me, it's it's a sense of uncertainty that I've mm-hmm. never had before. I'm mm-hmm. I'm a pretty bold person, and I'm. You know, I consider, maybe I'm not fearless, but I'm, you know, I'll do whatever I want to do and live the way I want to live and go where I want to go. But the notion that I'm, I guess that's that uncomfortable feeling you're talking about, that everything is is different and you don't know what's going to happen. Absolutely. And and since this thing started, it's almost like every day there's some new development and we're all, what's next? What's next? What's next? Even going to the grocery store now, you know, uh, with suspicion of the people who, who don't wear a mask. For me, I don't care who you are, mask up. That's my... <laughs> That's it. That's, it. That's, That's kind it. of my mantra, so that <laughs> that kind of um, uh, uh, lack of trust. What do you think this has done to our trust? Mm. As at, If we ever even had trust, I don't know, as a community or as a, as a country. Do you think this is uh, not trust out the window? I don't know. I think I think trust is one of those things that as a country we always struggle with. I mean... It's always this us versus them, you know? Are you Democrat? Are you Republican? Are you male? Are you female? Are you vaccinated? Are you not vaccinated? And I think, you know, it just it just shines a light on how we really struggle with coming together as people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I've noticed, too, is that we seem to be, now you guys will have to help me with this, I see more anger out there. Uh, and I, I wonder, well, what happened to that? How, where did the anger come from? Is that COVID? Is that mm. the social justice issue that also exploded in the last eighteen months? Fear produces anger. You take a dog. If you put a dog in the corner and you start coming towards it, it's gonna growl first. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna bark, and then at some point, if it's angry enough, it's gonna bite. And so, fear is the beginning. And then it leads to the outbursts. That's what you're seeing on airplanes. People are fearful of being around people in proximity to them. You get bumped by the 
the woman who is trying to serve you some coffee and now you want to take it out on her and punch her in the face? Yeah. You see, that's an extreme case. But my point is people are on edge because of fear. Mm. There seems to be so much, well, so much more fear mm -hmm. because of that. Mm -hmm. But this fear seems to be out of control because that's the other thing. Now, certainly in news, we're going to hear the most extreme cases. Right. But I would suggest that we are seeing more extreme cases. Absolutely. Mental health is at a real crisis in this country. Mm -hmm. At least what I see anecdotally. Do you guys see the same thing where, you know, people are have shorter tempers and it just... <laughs> The, the crimes seem to be a little bit more extreme to me. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I think I think mental health is a real problem right now. And I think it shines a light on the fact that we just don't have enough surfaces. Mm -hmm. For instance, you take high schoolers or, or kids that are in school, a lot of them really struggle with the social anxiety aspect of like being around other people. And now that they're being forced to go back to school, you know, after a year of remote learning, all of a sudden... There was really no plan put in place to deal with the fact that these kids might have some social emotional issues and anxiety connected with that. So I think it's I think the pandemic caused more fear, but I think the pandemic also shined a light on the fact that we really are not equipped to deal with the mental health crisis in this country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, and I would add that uh, <laughs> Carleen Shaka, who's the a clinician and also a director of the Corey Johnson program, said something brilliant the other day about how the children should have come back to school and had two months of counseling before mm -hmm. a book was even cracked open. I think that should have been true for society. Mm -hmm. You're putting all this money towards vaccines. Why don't you make it possible for clin uh, clinics, uh, hospitals to provide for free mental health screening for staff of, you know, uh, whatever, wherever, mm -hmm. uh, shopping mall, people, you know what I'm trying to say? Like, yeah, man. Just make it p open for the public mm -hmm. and get people to talk. That, well, that's why I think what we're doing is so important, and we're yes. seeing that resonate with just, uh, you know, can we talk? Because people are asking us if they can replicate what we're doing. That's right. Uh, just to give people the opportunity to say, you know, I'm hurting, or yeah. just... Uh, the idea that you can ask somebody, how are you today? That's right. And really mean it. Because who does that, right? Right. And coming from a, a faith-based community, we will show up on Zoom or now in church, you know, with <laughs> in person, a few of us in person. And when you hear a person say, oh, the Lord has blessed me throughout this whole thing. I'm good. Okay, come on. Okay. Me too. And let's take it to another level mm -hmm. with this conversation. Mm -hmm. Let's not just end with, I'm blessed and highly favored. Mm -hmm. We know that already. Mm -hmm. Let's take it a step further. How mm -hmm. are you really doing? How are you really feel? Yeah. You know why you and I talked to this uh, about this before, why people are so prone not to talk about how they really feel. And, you know, mm -hmm. I had said, well, maybe that's just men, but I think it's all of us. Mm -hmm. We want to put that front, that mask on. Oh, Yeah that says I'm fine. Everything is fine. Right. But what is that about? What why are we why are we, you know, not willing to be vulnerable? So Issa and I have had these conversations <laughs> over the years. Uh, and I think part of it is you read all the books about social anxiety and about social emotional uh, conditions that we're in. I think it has to do with once again fear of being exposed. I don't want yes. people to know my inner thoughts. Yeah. Mm. Like, for instance, when the pandemic first kicked off last year, I remember not wanting to talk with anybody about what I was thinking about. Mm. <laughs> I didn't want to talk to anybody, mm. family, you name it, friends. I stayed, it was, I went into a real shell for a minute, for about a month. And then I forget what snapped me out of it. It was someone called, someone, a family member just, but my point is, I was walking on my hands throughout the house. I was upside down for a month. Wow. And wow. Um, it took me to start talking and hanging out with people to realize you were upside down for a month, yeah. right? Yeah. But yeah. for that month, I wasn't talking to nobody. Right, right, right. I think that when it comes to it, safety is, safety is a prerequisite mm -hmm. for vulnerability, you know? To get to a place where you can open up and be vulnerable with somebody else about what you're going to going through. You have to be safe. 
You have to be in a place where you feel like you're not being judged and what you say will not be used against you. Like it's a court of law, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think we live in a culture where, what I like to call resume culture, where we're always putting, checking off the dots about, you know, what accolades we have and what we do well. And we really don't like to talk about what we don't do well and what we're struggling with because we're always looking for that next gig, that next job, that next opportunity. We're always selling ourselves for the next thing. And I think we have to create spaces like uh, Can We Talk and spaces like Just Between Us where we can be open and vulnerable in a safe environment. And safety is a, a, a main issue. Huge. But this is about change. So yes. everything has changed now. Yes. yes. We are not going to uh, live the way we've lived before, whether we know it or not. Uh, <laughs> part of that is, okay, COVID-19 and all the things we've been through. But part of change, that is just life. Yeah. That's life right. is about change. Yeah. That's right. and, and sometimes that's difficult for us. Any, any thoughts on why that is? I mean, we just eat, the status quo is just comfortable. Been doing it this way, been living this way, don't want to be anything but this. What, what, or what are your thoughts about that? Well, I think safety is necessary, but I also think safety in the form of being too comfortable can be a stumbling block. And I think sometimes when life is, is, is transitioning around us, you're being put in a position where you're not safe, where you don't know maybe necessarily where your next check is coming from or the way you did things for the last five to 10 years, you might not do it that same way. And that can make you feel unsafe. But I also believe that those are the spaces where we grow the most. And so we have to get to a place where we can allow ourselves to feel vulnerable, allow ourselves to feel unsafe so that we can grow and mm. stretch. We are living in a time where it's not just one or two things that are changing. It's about 20 things that are changing. Mm -hmm. And the pandemic accelerated that change. Absolutely. Okay, here's another change that we're going to have to deal with globally. And this country, this is the fight we're in right now. The browning of America, the, the literally, the, 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 the race and cultural makeup of this country is changing, right? 2043 predominant that's why we're having this war we're having right now this culture war this kind of verge of the race war all of this because america is not what what the predominant culture wants it to be it's it's becoming a culture of the world everybody anybody can come in that change it'll be that's what we're fighting to the death for that change if you pay attention to what's going on so it's not just the forces of it's just an interesting time to be alive. <laughs> Bringing that back home, how does that affect okay. our everyday lives? Okay. Let's go there then. <laughs> Let's go there. So uh, the late Harold Cromer, tap dancer, said to me, we have been improvising off of the melody that America has given us since the beginning. Mm -hmm. They tell us to do X, Y, and Z. And what we do, we improvise off of what they tell us to do. That's okay. how we was able to survive. Talking about jazz, he was saying how the jazz musician will have a melodic line that they have to follow, but then they improvise as well. And so the structure of America is set. It was set from the beginning mm -hmm. that you had to have poor people in order for there to be rich. And we the people, they weren't saying we the poor people. They were saying we the rich and privileged people. That's who they were talking about. Mm -hmm. So everyone else <laughs> didn't matter. But now we're here and we matter. So that's part of the reason why Black Lives Matter became such a big deal because it's so obvious that we don't matter to them. And we need to say that we matter for us, mm -hmm. right? So let me just say this. The money has always been the issue. We were bought here as Africans for the money. Uh, the Asians went through their transition and then they figured out how to get the money and now they're doing the money thing. The Italians went through their a real deep top, dark time of crime in this country, then they figured out how to organize and now they're getting the money. Then you had Jewish mafia as well who went through their thing and then they organized and now they're getting the money. So when it comes to the browning of America, black and brown bodies, the, the commodification of black, brown, and black, and black and brown bodies, we have to look at what are the forces that are pushing us 
away from organizing because every culture that has done well here organized. And we thought we had um, something going on in the 60s with our organizations that were popping up, but then that got like demolished when King got killed. So how are we organizing? Because America's not going to change. The Constitution is going to always be the Constitution. So we have to figure out how to organize. And I don't mean organize like, you know, with the fist in the air and smack you if you get too close. I'm talking about the way it was done in the 60s for a minute. We had lawyers and doctors and uh, clergy, politicians even, who were coming together and figuring out plans so that people of color can do well here. One of the things that's really disheartening to me right now is how um, in certain states they're trying to remove slavery and the history of African American people and the way it actually happened from the history books. And when I think about that, it's really about uh, not only the preserving the rewritten narrative that happened, but it's about controlling the minds of people. I mean, just like you said, Reverend Liz, I mean, the way that the population is going in, in, in a few years, just, there's definitely going to be more people of color than white people. But my question then becomes like, you know how they say all folks that are, uh, what they say, all skin folk and kin folk? How how do we make sure that the the next generation of people that look like me think like me, and understand like me, and believe the history like me? Because if they're removing it from the school books, if they're removing the struggle of what our people went through from the educational system, then you'll have someone that looks like me but doesn't believe like me. Well, part of it is, and I, I'm not going to try to give you a, a neat pat answer. Uh, you know, the winners write the history books, correct? Oh, so the winners write history. And and uh, our stories have always been written by other people. So one, we this is very simple, and this is very one-on-one. -on -one. We have to be in control of our stories. We have to be in control of our narratives. The other thing to pay attention to politically, and this is to uh, Wyatt's point, uh, Texas is, controls books. All the books that go into public schools come out of Texas. And, and those are publishers and uh, content providers. And so that's why what happens in Texas is, is really important to the nation's public school system. So you have to be aware and understand uh, the bigger story that's going on and why you have a stake in it. If you don't think you have a stake in it or you think it's, you have no power, because that's part of our problem, uh, as a people, we, we think that we don't have power, then you're not going to be involved and engaged. So that's my advice is don't ever uh, give up, relinquish, you know, any, any grip you have on your story and on your, uh, on your right to, 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 to the quest for power, for power, not, not equity here, but power. And so we need to always keep that in the forefront. And, and that's a tough battle. That's a tough battle. We, we have to be the change. It's simple. It's, it's cliche-ish, but it's true. And you have to do that on every level. And I want to thank you both uh, for, for being on the podcast today to talk about change. Because it's bigger than just Judell left and I'm sad. It's, it's really about adjusting to everything that's going on. And being aware is the first step. And uh, there's a lot going on. And that's it for this week's Just Between Us. We hope you'll continue to join us here when we, uh, when we have these podcasts. We also want to invite you to our weekly Zoom conversations called Can We Talk? Where people from all walks of life share their stories of loss, grief, hope, and healing. If you want to learn more about Can We Talk, if you want to learn more about the Corey Johnson program, visit our website at rpcsocialimpactctr.org. That's rpcsocialimpactctr.org. Thanks for joining us. Be blessed.